Okay, so today we're going to be talking about gold and silver. These are fun metals to be talking about because everybody's always been fascinated with them. So the first thing you have to think about are what are some of the properties of gold and silver? So the properties of gold are, well, it's very dense, so it's a heavy metal. It's yellow, buttery color. It's very attractive to people. And one of the most important properties of gold is, is that it doesn't oxidize or rust. So of all the materials that we will talk about in all these lectures, this is the one material that seems to be fairly corrosion resistant. All right, now gold also has the property of being very thermally and electrically conductive. And so that's an advantage. Finally, gold doesn't react with acids. So people often were trying to figure out whether they were being handed something like this, which is fool's gold, which is also called iron pyrite, or real gold. And the simple test was you would put it inside of some nitric acid. This sample will dissolve in nitric acid, whereas gold would never dissolve in nitric acid. And we call that the acid test. And so that was extremely valuable as a way of determining whether or not you were getting pure gold or whether you were getting some alloy or something that was false. Now, when you think about silver, silver is also a very precious metal. It's not as precious as gold because it's not as rare. Silver has a really unique property in the sense that it is electrically the most conductive metal we've ever discovered. And since when you alloy a metal, it makes it less conductive, it's probably de doomed to become our most conductive metal for all time. Um, it found its place also as a coin. Now, one of its biggest properties is the fact that it also has the ability to conduct both electrically and thermally, and it also tends to react with air. And so, but in this case, silver does form an oxide or a sulfide. And that material property is what people used for a long time to develop photography and et cetera. So both of these metals have very, are very, very soft, and both of them are very malleable, meaning that like you could take a, a gram of gold and you can pound it into a sheet that would be on the order of a square meter or less or more. And so these films, these ultra thin films of gold have some properties that are really advantageous for example in the visor of astronauts helmets because it becomes transparent when it gets extremely thin and it actually has a blue color. So now we have to think about how do you go about extracting gold and silver. Now silver extraction was the first thing you did. This is a sample of lead sulfide. It's also called galena and galena was very common and it turns out that for every ton of this material there's one pound of silver inside of here and the question is how do you get this out and so the they figured this out pretty early on using a process that the romans called cupellation and what they did was is they would take this lead sulfide and put it into a crucible uh, typically a ceramic bowl and they would add then chips of ceramic or bone or shells, and then they would heat it up. And when you heat it up somewhere around 960 degrees, the lead sulfide will oxidize and it comes off. And when that gas is emitted, you don't want to be breathing it. So they put all these other bits like the shells and the bone in there to absorb the lead sulfide. And what was left behind was the silver. So that was a very simple process of making silver. Of course, in that process, you're releasing a tremendous amount of lead. So there's two challenges there. One was is that the lead is obviously very toxic and so it polluted many of the lakes in Northern Europe for a long time. And that was all a byproduct of this cupellation process. The second thing that you did with the lead was you wanted to find an application for it. Now, one of the questions you might ask yourself is why do we call it a copper age or a bronze age and not a lead age? Well, the reason is, is that lead was so soft it really wasn't applicable to things like uh, military applications, but it could be alloyed or used, for example, as a roof sheeting material so that you could put it on your roof because it was still waterproof. And you could use it to line, say, the aqueducts uh, or water pipes with this. Um, and of course, you might think that then that would poison all of the Romans who were sitting around uh, lining their aqueducts and then drinking water that was laced with lead, but the water they were drinking was so rich in minerals that it coated that lead lining and actually reduced the amount of lead they were ingesting. Lead ha has an interesting property in that it accumulates in the nervous system and the bones and the liver. 
and it will impair red cell blood, blood cell production. So it causes a form of anemia, fatigue, and death. So it's obviously something you want to deal with very carefully. But this ability to turn something that was one metal into another metal fascinated them. And so this was really the birth of alchemy, which of course didn't reach its peak until probably the Middle Ages. Okay, so now let's talk about gold extraction. How do you get gold out of the ground? Well, obviously it's very rare. And so if you have a lot of machinery, one of the things you can do is you can sluice it. And so that's what you did uh, from the 1849s in California all the way up to modern times. However, back in ancient times, they didn't have the ability to move large quantities of dirt like that. So the way they got the gold out of the, uh, out of the ore was to actually use an amalgamation process. Amalgamation involves basically where you crush the rock up and then you pour mercury over the top of it. Now the mercury, the gold will dissolve into the mercury. Mercury is a, a metal, but it's also a liquid. And so as it flowed over, it would accumulate all the, all the gold would go into the mercury and dissolve into it. And then you could accumulate that mercury at the end and boil it off and it would leave the gold behind. And you could then condense the mercury and reuse it. So that was an amalgamation process that was very common for a couple thousand years. More recently, they invented a process called cyanidation, in which they use a cyanide compound, a solution. And again, gold is soluble in a cyanide solution. And so this is actually more efficient than amalgamation, so you can extract very high percentages of the gold. However, it's also potentially very toxic. Now, if the gold and silver was in a copper, so we, we talked earlier about copper and copper alloys, sometimes there was gold and silver mixed in there and you wanted to get it out. Then they used a process called liquation. So liquation is where you take your copper plus gold and silver and you would mix in lead and heat it until the lead melts. And what happens is the gold and the silver now want to leave the copper and go into the lead. So now you wind up with lead laced with lots of copper, I mean lots of gold and silver. And of course, at that point, you then would turn to a cupellation process, as we just discussed, to extract the gold and the silver from the lead. So those are three ways in which you could get gold. Now, Finally, let's say I've actually separated my gold and my silver from my other metals. How do I actually separate gold from silver? That was a process that was invented back then called parting. And the common mixture of gold and silver was electrum, which was used in ancient Lydia as a coinage metal. But if you wanted to enrich the ratio of gold to silver, then you use this parting process. And parting used the fact that if you heated it this metal, this mixture of metals up in a crucible at 1,000 degrees C for 24 hours with some salt in it, and that was the key, then what would happen is, is that we talked earlier about the fact gold doesn't rust. Well, gold doesn't react with the chlorine, but silver will form a silver chloride. And so that allowed you to then form a silver chloride, separate that from the gold, then you could always recover the silver back again from the silver chloride. And so that was a way of extracting gold and silver are separating them, and that was called parting. Okay, so now we've talked about how you get it. The next question is, when did they start doing all of this stuff? What is the history of gold? So you can go back 40,000 BC, a very long time ago, when Paleolithic man was in some caves and they've actually found pieces of gold in these Spanish caves that was ind indicative of the fact they were using native gold for some uh, manipulation. It doesn't show up again in reasonable quantities until somewhere around 3000 BC. The Egyptians started using it a lot. Uh, they loved gold very much. They didn't use it for currency. They actually used barley for currency. But the Egyptians had a tremendous amount of gold. In fact, uh, King Tut's tomb alone has 240 pounds of gold in it. Um, then if you move forward to about 500 BC, the first coins are being made in Lydia. And you'll, you'll learn more about that in your reading when we talk about coinage. However, the gold and the silver that was being discovered in Lydia was extremely valuable in terms of sponsoring or supporting the rise of the Greek city-states. And then Alexander the Great 
They were all financed by gold and silver that was both found in Lydia as well as gold and silver they, they got from Persia and other places when they conquered them. Uh, somewhere around 300 BC, um, the uh, process of alchemy really started to take off. And this, of course, again, as I said earlier, did not reach its pinnacle until you got through the Dark Ages and the Renaissance, where people were really trying to spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to turn lead into gold. Now, the Romans loved gold, obviously. They had, they're actually the people who invented the cupellation process and the liquation process in terms of the naming of it. And uh, in fact, everything in Rome was actually purchased. So much of their gold came from Spain, uh, and it was mined there, and then it was also used to fund all of their conquests. In fact, when they started to run out of gold and silver, then what they did was they actually started to dilute the silver they were using in their coinage. So for example, the denarii went from something on the order of 100% silver down to 2% silver, and people started to hoard it, and this caused all sorts of problems with their economy and helped to contribute to the fall of the Roman Empire. So now gold was obviously not gone and it became instrumental as you went forward. So somewhere around 742 AD, Charlemagne started to overtake Russia and he plundered vast quantities of gold up there and that enabled him to actually conquer most of Western Europe. Around 1066, you had the Norman Conquest and the Norman Conquest was then enabled to return to a metallic currency standard. And this was started in England, where a pound literally meant a pound of sterling silver. Somewhere around the 1500s, early 1500s, of course, you have the rise of Portugal and Spain because they're using, they're going to Central and South America looking for gold to bring it back to again finance their navies. Um, in 1700s, there was gold discovered in Brazil, and they became a source of nearly two-thirds of all the gold being produced back then. Around 1800, we had the first gold rush in America, and surprisingly, that first gold rush had nothing to do with California. It was actually in North Carolina. And so they discovered a 17-pound gold nugget, and that spurred on the very first gold rush in Little Meadow Creek in North Carolina. Of course, John Marshall then finds some flakes of gold in John Sutter's gold mill near Sacramento, California, and that started the whole gold rush of the 1849s and 50s. Um, one of the interesting things that happened during that time was people, there was a, a, a gentleman, Edward Humong, Hargraves from Australia who said, I think I could actually find gold in Australia. And he went back and within two years started an Australian gold rush. Um, around 1857, there was a ship called the USS Central America and it was in the process of transporting much of the gold that had been discovered during the gold rush back to the East Coast. And as it came and it left from Panama and was carrying the gold up towards New York, when it ran into a hurricane and it actually sank off the coast of North Carolina. And in doing so, it went down with 30,000 pounds of gold on it. Now, in the 1880s, there was a man, George Harrison, who was digging around some stones near his house in South Africa when he discovered gold. And that started a massive gold rush and nearly 40% of all the gold that's ever been mined in the history of mankind came from South Africa. In 1898, two prospectors were trying to look around the Klondike and they found gold and that spurred the last gold rush in this country, which is the gold rush in Alaska. So a few things happened in the 1900s that were extremely important. One was in 1903, the Englehart Corporation introduced the first way to actually print gold onto a surface. And that really was one of the key elements to making printing technology for microcircuits possible. Now, in 1933, Franklin D. Roosevelt prohibited the ownership of any gold. And that was because he was trying to stabilize the banks in the great, during the era of the Great Depression and he didn't want people hoarding gold. Um, and the 1960s, the Americas were, 1961, Americans were actually forbidden from owning gold abroad. 
So gold was becoming something that you couldn't own as a citizen. All of that changed in 1973 when they not only devalued the gold, but they allowed it to float on the open market. And so in doing so, they allowed people in 1974 to actually own gold again. So in 1988, a man named Tommy Thompson discovered where the USS Central America had actually gone down off of the coast of North Carolina. The fascinating story there is, is that he was able to recover about 5% of the gold. And of course, he had a large number of investors that were trying to help him out. Now, one of the challenges with recovering that gold was that if you went down, it's, it was found several thousand feet under the ocean, so you couldn't get down there in person. But if you sent a remote operating vehicle down and you picked up a coin, you would scratch the coin. And that would then reduce the value of the coin because the coin was worth something because it was gold, but also something more because it was an uncirculated 1858 coin. So the question came, how do you get the coins off the bottom without touching them? And they came up with a very clever solution. They actually lowered a box over the gold and then they injected a plastic into that box. And that plastic then sealed all the gold coins. And then they could pull it up and dissolve the plastic and get the coins out without ever touching them. It's a fascinating story. Curiously enough, um, several years ago, all the investors that were backing Tommy Thompson asked him for their money back. They wanted to get their money. And he went in hiding. And he was uh, a wanted man until 2015. And when they found him living in South, uh, in South Florida, and so now he's actually being uh, prosecuted for what happened with the, uh, the mismanagement of the USS Central America. Another company is taking over the recovery since there's still 95% of that 30,000 pounds of gold sitting on the bottom of the ocean. So if you look at gold in its entirety to date, you could take a cube that is 20 meters on a side, and 20 meters tall, and that's all the gold that we've ever found in the world. And all of this gold comes from meteors. The reason is, is because when the planet was forming, gold is extremely heavy. And so gold would naturally go to the center of the Earth. That's where it would accumulate. So after the planet formed, there was no gold on the surface of the Earth. And so the only place that gold could come from was when meteors struck it. In fact, if you look in South Africa, that 40% of the gold comes from one meteor that hit South Africa about 2 billion years ago. So now you have an idea of where gold is found. It's found around the world, but it's distributed based on meteor strikes. Um, and it's not found everywhere. So what are the modern uses for gold? Well, the modern uses of gold include things like we take advantage of the fact that gold does not oxidize. So this is an extremely important property. If you're building a micro circuit, you don't want your contacts to rust. And so when they're building computer chips and they go to make the, the contacts to these computer chips, what they typically do is they will put down some kind of a solder, but they will either put a gold on top of it or use gold for the solder itself. And so it's used primarily for electronics. It's obviously still used actually primarily for, for silver, uh, for jewelry and awards applications. It can also be used in, for medical applications. This is a vial of gold nanoparticles. It doesn't look like gold, it looks red. And that's an unusual characteristic of gold in the fact that if you make it extremely small on the order of 50 to 100 nanometers as a particle, the plasmons or the resonance on the surface changes such that it no longer is gold in color, it's actually red in color. This was actually discovered in, med in medieval times and was used to color stained glass. So your red stained glass is actually red because of nanoparticles of gold. You could call your stained glass makers in the 1300s the first nanotechnologists. Um, today what we're actually using gold for is to treat, possibly treat, cancer and, and in different ways, either for diagnostics, so we can try to find it, or for therapeutic applications where you're actually treating it. You'll learn a lot more about this in the video on the future uses of gold. When you look at a breakdown in this figure next, you'll see that, that gold uses uh, primarily are in jewelry, but there are other applications of gold that can be found. And like I said, my, a lot of it is in microelectronics and other applications. Now, what about silver? So silver has some unique properties. Silver, because of the fact it does react,
it actually has an antimicrobial property. So in addition to being very conductive and being used a lot for things like um, alloys that can be used in, in contacts, um, it's also being used in things like, it's been used for a long time in photographic film, um, obviously in coinage and things like that. And finally, what they're using it now for also is in taking advantage of its antimicrobial properties. And in doing so, they're embedding silver nanoparticles into shirts and to plasticware, things like that, where you want to try to keep the bacteria from growing, or in the case of a shirt, possibly from smelling. Um, so, so both of these materials have tremendous properties. And, and so if you look at this next graph, you can see that silver has a more diversified application. As I said, it's used in lots of different things. Less so in photography now, because obviously we're using a lot of digital photography these days. And so that's replacing a lot of the old film-based photography. Finally, when you think about these metals, do we actually use them in their pure state? And the answer is no. We actually use them oftentimes in an alloy, right? So for example, you may have heard of white gold. That's when you mix gold with palladium and other metals. Or yellow gold is a mixture of gold and silver and copper, right? And you even have blue gold, which is gold and iron, or green gold, which is gold mixed with copper and silver, but a lot more silver than copper. So you have all these different forms of, co uh, of gold and these alloys. In addition, we always try to specify the amount of gold that's in your alloy. So we might call it 24 karat. That means it's pure 100% gold. But obviously, if you get down to 12 karat, it's 50% gold, etc. Anything less than about 10 karat is no longer deemed a gold. All right, it's, and so it may be gold in color, but it's not considered a gold because it's too dilute and it's gold. The same thing happens with sterling silver. Silver is not used in its pure form, it's way too soft. And so we typically will alloy sterling uh, silver and call it sterling silver. And that's where you mix 92% silver with a little bit of copper. And that strengthens it tremendously.